So good afternoon, everyone, and the people on the um, joining through the internet. Um, my name is Midori Yamamura. I am a co-curator of the exhibition Unhomeless New York City. Based on the 2018 Real College survey, 57% of CUNY students had experienced housing insecurities in previous year. In order to remove stigma of homeless, homelessness, in 2019, four professors at Kingsborough from three disciplines got together and started discussing about curating an exhibition. We initially thought of creating a safety space where students can open up and discuss problems. But the final exhibition consists of three parts. First, it objectively explains the causes of homelessness. The second, we assemble the artworks that shed the lights on lives of homeless people. And then the third and final section is about how can we envision our future differently from the existing model. As part of the final section today, we have the New York City's Chief Housing Officer, Jessica Katz. Um, and our goal is to discuss about the housing situation at the Kingsboro and mostly students as housing situation and how we can come up with the ideas toward solutions. So now I would like to um, introduce everyone to our uh, panel. So our moderator is Tom Angotti, who is a professor emeritus at Hunter College. Being an urban planner in the municipal government before he started teaching at Hunter, um, Tom knows development more than any uh, professor. So we are very fortunate. And he was uh, uh, the, uh, he established the Center for Community Planning and Development at Hunter College. And um, Jessica Katz is New York City's chief housing officer. She previously served for over 10 years at HPD, oversaw the creation of affordable and special needs housing. Uh, Rob Robinson, uh, who is next to me, uh, who is a housing activist and the co-curator of the exhibition. I was very fortunate to meet Rob accidentally at the Global Poverty Panel at the Graduate Center. It is his experience and understanding of the problems of about the housing crisis, which enabled us to curate this exhibition. So thank you very much, Rob. Okay, and Jason Leggett, uh, she sits in uh, opposite side of me uh, at the end is a professor of law and society, and he is also a co-curator of the exhibition. And last but not least, we have the former student assistant, Shindy Weichmann, who grew up in the Brooklyn Hasidic community of Williamsburg. She graduated in December, 2021. She is the first in her nuclear family to attend and graduate college. So without a further delay, I would like to invite Tom to lead the discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, so Tom, this is the mic. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I just saw the, the wonderful exhibit and I want to congratulate everybody who helped put it together, in particular Midori. Um, I just want to say a few words myself about the central issues uh, and then open up the conversation. I will let each one of the speakers do a brief introduction of themselves. I got introduced to the issue of housing and homelessness. Um, I came from a background of suburban privilege. And when I got into graduate school, I was fortunate enough to get 
uh, subsidized housing, married student housing. But it was quite deficient in many ways. And I wound up leading a rent strike against um, the university. And that was my introduction to housing policy. Uh, I was in an urban planning graduate uh, program. And it was also at the height of the civil rights movement in the 1970s. And um, that shaped the way I understood the housing question because in fact, the housing question has everything to do with racial discrimination and the long history of uh, bias in this country. Um, when I worked as a professional urban planner, these are the thoughts that followed me at every step of the game. And as I was constantly being barraged with um, a narrative that said, the way to solve the housing problem is to build more housing, it didn't quite line up with my understanding of the cities that I grew up in and the cities that I lived in and the housing problems that were um, so profoundly embedded in the urban fabric. So um, I'm not anti-growth, I'm not anti-development, but by themselves, growth and development don't solve the problem. It's not like if there's a potato famine, you sow more potatoes and you'll solve the shortage problem. It doesn't quite work that way because housing is built around another market, which is called the land market. So I wanna shift just to say a, a, a two words about um, the conversation at CUNY. When I was teaching at Hunter, at the Graduate Center even, it was very clear that a number of our students were unhoused. We had students sleeping and spending the night at the school and Hunter is the elite school in the CUNY system. Um, so how do you account for that? Uh, and uh, um, there was, um, there, there was a, a really blatant contradiction when we were discussing housing policy in class to know that um, it was not an abstract question for a number of students and also who are students who are food insecure as well as uh, poorly housed or even unhoused. Um, so that makes these discussions about homelessness, which have too often been relegated to the policy wonks and to the experts, the housing experts, the planning experts. These discussions are especially important for students, for faculty, for administrators as well. Um, I did talk with Many, many of the administrators at the university who understood and knew firsthand of stories about students who were, um, who, who, for whom housing was a real day-to-day -day problem, not an abstract one. So all of this to say, I applaud the efforts to spark a conversation among <clears throat> students, faculty and administrators um, about the whole question of housing and homelessness. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it was triggered by a wonderful exhibition um, and I'm glad to participate in this conversation. So let me, let me start by asking our panelists to weigh in. We'll go around for maybe five minutes each. Uh, five to 10 minutes each, and we'll come back and open it up. How does that sound? Well, first, let's start with Rob. So uh, thank you, Tom. Before I uh, give any remarks, I just wanna thank uh, the faculty that I've gotten to work with on this exhibition here at uh, Kingsborough. 
Um, And how do you remove the shame? How, what, what is that process like? I don't think we're going to solve that problem uh, with these uh, incredible people up on the stage today. I'm grateful that they're all here. These are people that I know well and gotten to work with. Some I know better than others. Um, the person representing New York City is somebody that I've worked with for 10, 15 years. Tom is somebody I've worked with for 10 or 15 years. So I've been blessed as an activist or an organizer to be surrounded by knowledge to help me shape my thoughts and ideas on this issue. But I feel a responsibility to society to give back the way people gave to me. To um, I openly talked about my issue. I was given a microphone in the stage to talk about these issues, talk about them publicly, and my profile got raised. But it's not about me. It's about a societal issue that we have to show humanity for. And we have to bring people into the conversation that are willing to open up about it. We've gone a long way to paint this issue with a broad brush in this country, right? And give a bunch of reasons why people... Um, couldn't pick themselves up by their bootstraps and, and house themselves. But we never talk about the roadblocks that were put before those folks, particularly low-income folks, uh, people of color, and some of the challenges, even when we want to give them a little something, we make it difficult for them to access it, right? By putting all of these obstacles in place. So it is, I, I, I think going forward, as I said, we won't solve this problem here in the conversation today. We are missing the director of student services here at, at the Kingsborough College, but I committed to that person that I will work with her long past this exhibit to try to create spaces where students feel comfortable to come in and talk about this. It's not gonna be an easy task, but I'm willing to make that commitment. And I think what we need is uh, to support the faculty who are interested in this issue and push the administration in a direction that they understand that this is an issue that they have to participate in and help us find the solution. So I'm committed to it. Um, I will do everything I can to support the folks who put together this exhibit and support the faculty as we try to resolve this issue of, of food insecurity and housing insecurity at Kingswell College. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Jessica Katz. I'm the Chief Housing Officer in City Hall, um, newly incoming with the Adams administration. Previously, uh, as was said, I was, did spend most of my career at the New York City's Department of Housing Preservation and Development. But for the last four years, I was the Executive Director of the Citizens Housing and Planning Council, which is a research and advocacy organization, um, about an 80-year-old think tank here in New York City. So after a long career in city government, and then four years spent like telling City Hall what they were doing wrong and penning snarky op-eds about the way that they should be doing better, um, when given the opportunity to come back in to city government and get my hands dirty and fix it myself, I feel like I couldn't uh, pass up that opportunity. So I'm very happy to be back in public service and really excited to focus on the housing issues that the city faces, which are really substantial. Um, I bring to the Adams administration the radical notion that homelessness is a housing problem. Um, it is very convenient when we try to frame it as a mental health problem, as a substance abuse problem. There's any number of different ways that we try to describe homelessness. Um, and it's true, there's plenty of people who need social services, who need mental health supports. 
Uh, but in some ways, I think we get the causality wrong a little bit. So I think if any one of us spent three nights sleeping on the subway, I think we would have a pretty severe mental health issue. Perhaps I would want a little taste of something to take the edge off to try to help get me through the day. So in some ways, these are, um, you know, I think these issues are related, obviously, but I think it's, it's, a, it's convenient in a way for us to frame homelessness as an issue of personal responsibility, as these kind of intractable social service needs that we want to get you ready so that before you can be ready for housing. Um, so I come to housing kind of through a like a Psych 101 Maslow's hierarchy of needs a framework where Yes, of course, you need all these other things, but you have to start with having a roof over your head and some food in your mouth before I can ever start to work with you on your mental health needs, on solving your substance abuse issues, on getting a job, things like that. So we want to make sure that we really get those base needs met before we do that. And I think housing really represents the, the, the key one for me, and certainly in New York City, the one that's the most difficult to come by. Um, so that's an important place to start from where kind of where I come to this issue. Um, one of the things that I'm going to keep saying out loud is that I can't, no one should let me quit this job before making a real dent in the administrative burdens that we are facing in our city's social safety net. So we have a Section 8 program and a very robust housing lottery program and very surprisingly well-funded um, rental subsidy programs kind of all across the board. Uh, but each time we create one of those programs, we in some well-meaning ways, and maybe perhaps in some not as well-meaning ways, we create a new set of burdens in order to be able to access those. So some of those, I think my, my philosophy on that is that there's kind of two categories of those types of administrative burdens. In some ways, they come from the kind of pejorative, um, they better, they got to deserve it. If they need it bad enough, they'll work through all these processes, kind of like the welfare queen model of program design. Um, and then there's the kind of well-meaning ways in which we design our programs to say, hey, I just, I want to make sure I'm serving the most vulnerable person. I want this program to help the people who need it the most. So when we do that, it is in very well-meaning, you know, for all the right reasons, but often what we do is we create a program and say, I want it to serve this kind of person, this kind of person, and this kind of person. That is absolutely the correct mindset. Um, but in doing so, we create a program that now all of a sudden, everyone who applies to it has to attest to whether or not they are a survivor of domestic violence. Every single person has to attest to whether or not they are a NYCHA resident or any kind of other category that we create to say you are the most vulnerable. So what does that mean? That means when you're moving into a, uh, if you're, living on the street and you're schizophrenic, before I can move you into a housing unit, I need you to go and see a psychiatrist who can prove to me that you're schizophrenic. Well, I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure I can tell if someone's schizophrenic. And I'm pretty sure that you've ever been diagnosed with schizophrenia that for the most part, that diagnosis doesn't go away. And it certainly doesn't go away after you've been living on the street for two years. And yet we've kind of created these systems where we blindly create eligibility criteria, which again, with the most well-meaning um, intentions, we create these real hurdles. So I think that's something that we see across the board that I'm really committed to fixing. And it's also something that I would expect that some of the students here and the other schools will experience when they try to go seek help, right? All of a sudden you, you, you're, you're at your, you, you need something, you're at your most desperate moment, you're finally ready to reach out for help. And the minute that that happens, it's like the forms start to come at you, the next meeting, the next meeting, the give me your pay stub, give me this, give me that. So that's something that I just want to kind of acknowledge um, and make sure that that's it's not it's not you if you're experiencing that that is in fact how we've designed those systems they are with a little patience and a little perseverance it's possible to move through that but I think if anyone's out there kind of applying for those programs and thinking they're trying to make it hard you're not wrong about that so just keep that in mind as you keep kind of keep hang on with the stubbornness to move that through. Um, we currently have, so you have an ally in me trying to resolve some of those issues and weed whack some of that bureaucracy. And we also have a commissioner at the Department of Social Services that has a history of homelessness himself as a child. So he's someone who really sees this not from the lens of a government program trying to function with making sure we dot all the T's and cross all the I's, but from literally through the eyes of a child who has been through his system, the system himself. So I think we've got a really great team that we put together to try to really put our best foot forward and try to solve some of these issues. Um, and then finally, I want to make sure we have a housing plan coming um, shortly. 
And we're really working with Rob and with others to make sure that this housing plan isn't just focused on the housing industry, but that of the housing problems of the city of New York writ large. Uh, and as part of that, to make sure that people who have a lived experience of homelessness are really sitting in the driver's seat as we try to craft that plan and hear from that experience, as opposed to just having it be a plan that situates housing sort of in the real estate industry. Um, that's my intro, but I'm happy to also. Uh, thank you, Jessica, you, you triggered in me a number of thoughts that I just want to lay on the table before we go on to the, the next two people. Um, um, policy in the United housing policy in the United States is based on the idea that government is there to uh, um, uh, stimulate the market to solve the problem. It's not based on the right to housing. So I want to put the right to housing on the table as one of the fundamental. It's not just philosophical, but it's built into the law. There's no constitutional guarantee uh, of housing for anybody. And, um, and so that's the mentality. And I did, I did serve a couple of years at HPD before I went on to work for the city planning department. But our conversations and our dialogue in those agencies are all about um, making sure that the right people get the housing. Well, who are the right people? It's the people who qualify uh, economically, who have jobs, who are already in a position that they can find housing on the market. And it's only, and government's responsibility is to stimulate the market. Government never does it. And I remember being at HPD and talking to people, oh, well, if we provide too much, who, who are critical of public housing, which was, the largest public program to guarantee housing for people who needed it. And the criticism was, if we build more good housing, then you're gonna get people, more people migrating from South Carolina, from uh, Atlanta, and it'll never end. We'll never solve New York's housing problem. Well, there we are. So I would just put on the table that, uh, if you have that framework of thinking, and if you're, it's not about really helping people who need the help the most to find housing, providing that housing and pu putting the dollars behind it, uh, putting the money behind it that it takes when the housing is not available on the market, which it usually isn't for people with low, in low incomes and people who are working. So anyway, I just wanna put those ideas on the table right to housing. Well, so I'm actually going to interrupt on that for a moment because <laughs> as luck would have it, Rob and I actually co-authored an op-ed last year about the right to housing and specifically about how you would make right to housing, how you would take that past a slogan, right? We'd love to talk about this. We've never quite been able to operationalize what that actually means of what a right to housing is. Um, so this is what Rob and I came up with when we wrote this piece. One is that we would create a universal access to a rental subsidy program. So there was a, a glimmering hope for a moment that this would happen at the federal level. That does not appear to be quite the case at this moment, but that's still something that we should fight for to make housing affordability something that anybody could kind of get access to. Um, but then you also need to say, what, you know, why do we use the term right, right? We're not saying we think it's great if you have access to housing. What a term right means is that it's sort of almost more than democracy, right? That like a right to housing means that it is more important than my right to say, I don't really want you living in my neighborhood. So right now we have, a, we have a intention of a right to housing a bit, although not a right to housing, but then we have a land use process around creating housing, which presumes that the number one goal is to find out from the people who already are stably housed in this neighborhood, what they think should happen in this neighborhood. And what we posited in our op-ed was that a right would make it higher order a higher order issue than that, where you don't get to show up to a community meeting. And this is tough to say, you don't get to show up to a community board meeting and say, I don't want that housing in my neighborhood because it's a right. You don't get to have that. that that's not an opinion that we are gonna make government in the service of. And yet our land use process kind of hasn't been aligned with that. And then once you have those things, then you do need the housing supply. 
Because one of the things that we struggle with in New York is that we have a wealth of rental subsidy programs and we really have a hard time. Once people have a voucher, they're still running around looking for housing for months and sometimes longer. So just a, a follow-up response. Um, so my background is in human rights. I work internationally a lot around that. And one of the projects I work on outside of this is with the former UN Special Rapporteur, Leilani Farhar, who is now running an NGO up in Toronto, Canada called Make the Shift. And the idea during her campaign or her term as Rapporteur, she wanted to shift us from talking about the right to housing to making it a reality. She has now created a model up in Canada where she's talking to municipal governments and trying to get folks in the room to understand what that means. It's a tall order, right? Um, while many of us, Tom, Jessica, all of us up here believe in a right to housing, we have a, a country that has looked at the human rights as in this exceptionalist, this abstract idea but it's a reality and you see this happening in other countries around the world. So there are models where that almost became law, international law supersedes your civil law. And you know it'll be a long time before we get there, but I think those conversations are happening now. And I'm looking, Leilani is in Pittsburgh right now. She's about to travel back home for this weekend, but we have a call set up for next Tuesday where we want to, I want to try to replicate that model. I want to replicate what she's doing, those initial conversations that she's having in Pittsburgh, because I think that's important for us to create a space that different levels of society are having these conversations and working towards this goal together. So I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, let's, let's move on. I, I want to comment on that later though. So our other panelists have an opportunity to, Weigh in. I think it'd be good for you. And when people hear, oh, you have a Section 8 housing voucher, no, you're not a good fit for whatever it is we're renting. Also, a Section 8 housing voucher has a limit. You can only rent up to a certain amount per month. Housing units don't match that. And so here we are. Um, I'm here because I happen to be a student of Professor Midori's in our art history class. I remember thinking, oh my God, art history, I want this to be over, like I don't want to do this class. Um, and I ended up being really enthralled by the way of her teaching, so much so that the next semester around, I emailed and I asked, are you doing an art history too? <laughs> because I found something that works, I want to stick with it. And she said, no, but I'm doing a contemporary art, would you like to join? I don't know why I said yes, but I did. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, the focus was on homelessness. And I was like, yes, okay, I'm listening. Um, and then she asked, do you wanna come on to this exhibit? And in my head, I'm thinking, what are you thinking? An exhibit for homelessness that doesn't even make any sense. Like, what, why? Um, I said yes, because I often just say yes without thinking about what it is that I'm doing. And I also like to say yes to things that otherwise I would have never done. Uh, it's a strange reality, struggling with homelessness and working on an exhibit for homelessness or that tackles homelessness, especially having exhibits. You know, there are installations in our exhibit that date back a couple of years, 10 years, maybe 20 years. And I'm sitting here thinking, Okay, and what has changed? The other part is people often say, if you don't ask for what you need, you might not get it. But also the people that are suffering, 
can't always be the ones that are helping themselves because we're just trying to get through the day. So we need other people who are not struggling in this issue to step up and to put their hand out and grab us out of where we are. Um, I'm currently housed, luckily, but it's like a guessing game of till when will this last? Because my current landlord doesn't wanna take the Section 8 housing voucher on principle. She's like, I just I won't take money from the government. And I'm like, you took the ERAP money. What are you even saying? Um, and looking for new housing, <laughs> I'm laughing, but really I'm crying. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. Um, and a part of me is just feeling very vulnerable to be sharing about things that most people don't talk about. People don't want to tell you that they're unhoused. People don't want to tell you that they don't earn enough to pay fair market rent. They don't want to talk about this. And people who hear that you're struggling like that, they don't know what to do with it. They're like, well, why don't you fix it? Why don't you get a house in New Jersey? So that's my opening bit, Jason. Thank you very much. So I think I, where I'd pick up on that uh, is a little bit of a, a counter argument uh, towards Rob, what you said about, I mean, this is an argument for why we can't wait, right? It's a socially constructed problem. We should be able to construct an answer to this problem. Um, I've also experienced housing insecurity, but by the grace of others, right, was able to find a place to live for almost eight months. I, at that point, uh, considered myself to be a hardworking guy who didn't fit the stereotypes um, and really honestly didn't see it coming. I mean, a lot of people, I think, uh, Tom, yourself, have said you, no one saw the 2008 collapse coming, and yet there it was. Um, so I think, you know, like Shindy, it's, you know, it, I'm housed at the moment, but I don't feel secure in that housing. I'm, you know, the landlord can do more or less whatever she wants. Um, I come from a legal background. Uh, my earliest mobilization efforts, you know, over 20 years ago were in environmental issues. Same enemy, same problem. What was the same solution put forward? The environment needs rights. Uh, I then worked in immigration issues. Same enemy, same problem. Immigrants need rights. Then in children's education and desegregation. Same enemy, same problem. What do children need? They need more rights. Uh, so I obviously, when I got to undergrad and law school, was very interested in this rights talk. What is all this rights talk? Uh, and I found from critical race scholars and critical legal studies that, that rights talk is necessary, but it's not sufficient for actual social change. And I think through this process, one thing that has been interesting, or, or at least when Midori presented the idea uh, over two years ago, I thought, what a breath of fresh air to hear from artists. <laughs> what do they think should be happening? Because I don't know if I could hear any more right stock, and I don't know if I can hear one more policy proposal that, in essence, raises the argument that shows us the contradiction between property rights and human rights. I mean, we've known this for a very long time, and yet we keep just talking about that contradiction, but we cannot seem to resolve it. So I was hopeful. I thought it would be interesting to see what artists could do to try to raise awareness and maybe bring an outsider's perspective to the issue. I think that has been accomplished. I think there are a variety of viewpoints that have been presented uh, in the exhibition. Um, and I think students that have been involved, at least the students I've worked with, have been interested in I think the central question is what kind of shiny yes is why would artists do this? <laughs> why would they go into something that uh, doesn't appear glamorous, doesn't appear it's going to get them uh, much publicity. Uh, it's not going to be in, in MoMA. Um, and so we've had conversations about different venues, different avenues for social action. Um, but it does come to this basic idea of you know, students wanting to know why can't housing be a basic human right? Why, why, you know, what is the issue that's holding that back? Um, and I thought, what I loved, and I'll have Rob explain this, but I thought Rob's thesis of talking about the legacy of, of slavery, uh, racism, gentrification, 
Uh, and you know, the, I've understood that to be structural displacement in other fields. And so it's a, it's a solid argument that needs more uh, talking about and needs more support from educational structure. Um, and I think we know pretty concretely that, that, or at least from you know, research, homelessness has a very long tail and it seems to repeat in colonialism it repeats again in displacement of American Indians. It repeats again uh, with slavery. It repeats again after the Civil War. It repeats again after the Great Depression. I mean, it, it, the stories come back over and over and over again. And so again, we, we know that there's a long history. We know what needs to be done. Uh, and I think we just need to have the courage to just keep talking about what we know needs to be done. And I think, it, you know, I, uh, no offense, I am anti-growth and I am anti-development. I think anyone who's looking at climate change would say you'd be crazy to be pro-growth or pro-development at this point. And I think it's the same thing with homelessness. So just to wrap this up, I guess my thoughts, uh, bringing it back to Kingsboro, depending on how you wanna parse the numbers and Vicki Virgin has done a great job in the exhibition of parsing the numbers, uh, somewhere between 50% and 90% of students are housing and food insecure at Kingsborough Community College. That is an enormous number. And so Shindy made it, she's graduated, she's on her way onto the next uh, piece, but most students, they frankly, they don't make it. They don't get through their classes, they aren't retained, they don't graduate, they don't transfer. And so it's an issue that I think Midori was right to bring up and, and found out from students in her class that it's something that they're interested in. In my survey of students so far, over 80% of the students each semester are glad we're talking about housing insecurity. Something I probably should have thought about years ago, but I'm glad that it's been brought up through this exhibition. So I think again, you know, it's really just about, I hope and my, my ask here would be, uh, having a connection between the city government and education, at least here at Kingsboro, uh, what can we do in the concrete immediate future to solve this problem for students right now, today. Oh, great, I wanna pick up on, on that and in, interject what came to my mind before as well. Um, I attended with a, a number of noted housing experts from the United States, the 1996 UN Habitat Conference uh, the United Nations Conference on, on Habitat, Housing, and Urban Development. And a group of us got together, Peter Marcuse, who Rob knows, uh, very, knew very well, I'm sorry, Peter recently passed away, but uh, Peter Marcuse and many others joined together because the United States was one of two countries in the world that would not support the right to housing in principle, never mind practice, in principle. So we had discussions with the US delegation and they were all very apologetic because they were actually hired to go there and to spew the national line, which was, we can't do right to housing. So what is the objection to it? Well, if we, if we insert the right to housing in law, then that means we have to follow up on it. Then everybody will want a place to live. And we said, hello, that's what is needed. Everybody needs to have a decent, stable home in a decent community and environment. What's wrong with that? Well, you go trace it back to the legal, to the origins of the United States in uh, the US Constitution, uh, there's the right to own property. It's Article 5 of the Constitution, I believe, says you have a right to own property. At that time, you had to be a white male to own property. They were the only people who could own property. So it was mostly, it was almost entirely the European immigrants who could own property. It wasn't until um, a century or two later that the right to own property became much more broadly accessible to all. 
But so there's something very deeply in the legal structure in this country that militates against solving uh, problems of equality. And it's not a housing problem. It's a social equality problem that was there right from the start. And I do think it's linked to uh, displacement with which uh, Jason mentioned because once people are displaced from the communities where they grow up in, where they live, they, can, they are at the highest risk for being unhoused. And that does happen to be the story of those that the constitution didn't protect for the first couple of hundred years, African-Americans, women, Native Americans, who were in fact displaced and had no right to own property. They could not convert the land where they had grown up uh, to property because they were not protected. So there's something very fundamental here. Now, having said that, I'm totally against waiting to solve all the fundamental structural racial uh, problems but one of the and one of the ways to get at those problems, though, is through housing and community and uh, pro and providing incrementally as well as on a global level, everybody the right uh, um, to a decent. The 1934 housing. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 19. 47 Housing Act calls for a decent home uh, or a home, a basic home in a decent environment. It's in the legislation, national legislation, but it was never followed up on. The lobby in Congress right out, out the, at the beginning said we oppose public housing, despite the fact that it was in the law. So. Uh, so we have a, a lot of ongoing problems. New York has been in the forefront at different points of history by having the largest public housing stock. But when the neoliberal um, uh, era hit in the 1970s, it began to disinvest. And the idea was the market was going to solve the housing problem. So we need to stimulate the market and investment in publicly financed housing went down to the point where public housing today is in price, deep crisis. So having said that. Can you respond to that? Sure. So for me, uh, a couple of comments. I wanna start off with first, uh, thanking Shiny. Um, I have a lived experience. I don't know if folks know, uh, folks have access to my bio, lived on the streets for two and a half years. My opening remarks, I talked about that 10 months in the New York City homeless shelter. And it is very difficult in the environment that we live in in this country to share those types of stories, deep personal stories, because we've gone so far to shame people and, and mark them with a scarlet letter. So I, Shandy, I really appreciate you sitting up here and sharing with that. And I've committed to Shandy privately to work with her to try to resolve our issues, but that's not the way you fix a societal problem one piece at a time. Um, that aside, I'm committed to helping her straighten out that situation. But I think Jason made interesting comments and you know, I'm a believer in human rights and I believe that something has, has elevated here in this conversation around civil law and human rights law. And I think Tom was spot on when he said, it's written in old language. Our constitution is 400 years old, it's old language. For me, what got me interested in this is some of the newer constitutions around the world. And people would always ask me, how did you have time to do that type of work when, you know, when you're going through homelessness? Well, I was blessed to come out of it. I had support by a lot of different people from a lot of different directions. We don't need to go into the weeds with that, but it encouraged me to, to learn from others and learn outside of the U.S. where international human rights law was put into effect, right? We, so law, I've spoken a lot at law schools in this country, and what I found from these engagements is 
there is a reticence upon people to face the person in the black robe and the scales of justice that sit up on that, on that stage. So I said, what would happen if you walked into a courtroom and the person that you're defending that's about to be evicted said, I had a human right to a home and you based your arguments in human rights uh, framing. And they looked at me and they said, well, the judge would laugh me out. I said, did you ever try it? Because I doubt a judge would laugh you out because it, it, there's a stenographer and they're documenting every words. And I dare that judge to be the first judge to go on record to say, you don't have a human right to a home. The worst thing that judge is going to say is go in the back and see if you can negotiate a deal. I don't want this in front of me because it's sticky, right? With respect to human rights, Jason, here's, here's how I balance this in my system. In this country, for a person like me, a person of color, it was once civil law that I couldn't urinate in a certain bathroom in certain places. I'm a human being and I have to urinate, otherwise I'm gonna die, right? But we fought and that law got changed, right? We, we fought and that law got changed. Same thing with eating at lunch counters. So I'm giving you this from the African-American perspective where we're pushing this thing up a hill, but it's gonna take a struggle and it's gonna take a fight. But I've seen other countries. So I mentioned other countries around the world. Brazil's constitution in, in post-dictatorship says that land has to serve a social function. Thereby it has to be housing people, has to be feeding people. The MST, the largest social movement in the world, built themselves up by going out at night and finding large swaths of land that were vacant and the men would go in and start to plant food while the women took care of children, right? They, they re-envisioned society. Daylight comes, they start to find bamboo, which is plentiful around Brazil, and start to build an abode. All of a sudden, more people come, and then somebody has knowledge to take the plants from that land and heal the sick. Childcare problems go away, right? Uh, all of a sudden, you're building a community. So I say all of this to say, fundamentally, having access to land could change somebody's lives, right? The fact that land is a commodity is a problem. It's a huge problem in the city. I have a, a New York City representative here that knows this better than I do. We both know that air rights are for sale in certain parts of Manhattan, so it makes it difficult to you know, find housing that you can, you can put on that land that's affordable. But I also say South Africa. The constitution was written in 1996. Now, I'm gonna be very clear here. It guarantees the human right to housing in that constitution, but Abashali, the shack dwellers movement, is still fighting and still being targeted by municipalities because they took over land when they were guaranteed housing by the ANC. But it's in that constitution. So they have a basis to enter into that struggle. We don't have it here. All we have is our civil law. And basically our civil law is under capitalism, which says if you have money, you can have it. But if you don't have money, you can't have it, right? So I think what we need to understand is this difference between civil law and human rights law. And I have a lot of these conversations in law schools speaking. I spoke to this morning just to Miami Law School's Human Rights Institute around these speaking to a group of students around these very, very issues. And I think I give a lot of credit to young students who are coming out of law school right now who are thinking proactively, right? How can I change the world? How can I take my degree and change the world? Because the reality is not what I was led to believe that if I go to law school, I'm going to make $100,000 or a six-figure salary. I'm going to be able to buy a big house and live happily ever after. The reality is they come out of law school, they're looking at $200,000 in loan repayments. And if they're in New York City, the landlord wants $5,000 for a new apartment. They had to find five roommates so that they could split up the apartment and they can't find a job that's going to pay them more than $50,000 a year. So let me take my degree and make real social change. So I think I say all of this to say it's going to take a collaborative effort from a lot of different places to make the change that we need, Jason. It is a challenge. It's not easy. We've been talking about it a lot, but I do think we've seen it um, have results in other places. The final thing I'll say is there seems to be in this country a little bit of shame around international human rights law, and we guise it under this democracy. I would ask if we're a democracy, how was it that the people in Flint, Michigan voted for a city council who was thereby stripped of their power and that person in the name of bankruptcy, the governor appointed some a bankruptcy manager to handle the city's affairs and that person chose to feed the people poison water. I questioned this idea of a democracy 
if you if you ask me. So we need to rise up as people and start to challenge these narratives. And I think the more we do that, the more things will start to change. But right now we seem to have a fear about this change, right? And we have to organize. Part of the work that I do is organizing people to get them to understand this popular and political education is gonna help. Um, I work with progressive academics like Tom. He mentioned Peter Marcuse. These are folks who had mentored me. I work closely with Richard Wolf, a progressive economist in this country who went to school incidentally with our current treasury secretary um, but they have totally different views about the world, right? And so it's amazing, right? The education system can put out two types of people or people that find value in our education system in one way and value in another way. Finally, I'll say I never learned anything about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in school. So somebody, I think, and again, uh, Jason mentioned educational structure. A lot of the stuff I'm talking to you about was never exposed to me in school. I didn't learn it until I became an activist and got access from, from different places. So maybe, just maybe, our educational system is partly to blame here. So I'll stop there. Okay. She may not be able to hear you. Howdy, okay. Elmore, are you in the Zoom? No. Okay. Okay. I don't know if you have comments. Other comments? Yeah, uh, those who panelists on the same one on this one. Rob and I have talked about this quite a bit by this point, and this is a well-worn path in many law schools, including the one I went to, and I focused on human rights law in particular, I think, and was one of those students, like you said, that said, I'd rather do something meaningful with my life than, you know, work away 100 hours a week for somebody else's property value. Um, what I'm trying to say, I guess, and I'm not the only person to say this, but, uh, you know, when we frame within rights talk, what we seem to be saying is that the solution must exist within the state. And the state is going to grant this power to us. And so the dilemma I see is that on the one hand, a lot of people on the left talk about neoliberalism of the right, but there's also a neoliberalism of the left. And I think the dilemma of using the state to try to give out these rights, I think comes down to maybe just a concrete situation. So here are four little things I drew on my writing pad on the subway ride down here, uh, the two hour sub subway ride down here. Um, <laughs> and these are not in any particularly good order, but maybe Shindy, you can tell me what you think. Uh, perhaps the city could offer full support scholarships. So not just tuition scholarships and not just making uh, school cheaper as it gets more expensive and more expensive. Uh, but also to pay for housing, other expenses, and you know, it doesn't have to be very many of them, it could be a pilot program. Uh, I'm also thinking about the participatory uh, budgeting process, perhaps there could be something that's dedicated just to collective housing work, and Tommy Mintz has brought this up several times of examples in the city where collective housing has been successful. Uh, so perhaps if you got people together, uh, they could put budget plans up to city council for collective housing. Um, I wonder whether city support of student housing uh, is possible in the educational system. So could people from your office uh, be employed at least part-time here at Kingsboro? Mm -hmm. This is something that the group Young Invincibles uh, has been putting forward that we've talked to. Uh, and then finally, this is probably uh, a lot what, what you're saying, Rob, is something like the PERG model, right? The public interest uh, research group model where they could, we could have city partnership with colleges so that students uh, could study the issues uh, that we're talking about, both from a, a rights perspective, which again is necessary. I'm just arguing it's not sufficient, uh, but also has that mobilization piece to it that you're, you know, really talking about South Africa, Brazil, and the civil rights movement. You know, it's the mobilization that puts the pressure on 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 the government. Um, and so I think those two things maybe together would be, you know, those are four potential things that could be done, I think, that are concrete solutions that are pro proposed today, uh, that if we could agree to, uh, we would at least help some students. 
I can listen to this man all day. Oh, so you should probably hire him. Um, it's my but, chief promoter. <laughs> now to bring it back to reality, um, in 2018, still in the custody trial, my ex left that apartment that had my name on. My name was on the lease, my name was on the Section 8 voucher, and we asked the judge, can I please get an order saying that I can get back into the apartment? I was met in silence. So you're asking, would a judge actually prevent you from having basic housing? There's your answer. So that's number one. Number two, I did have the privilege of spending one night at DHS, emergency, I forget what the words are, um, with my son. You have to go to the housing department, or I forget what the words are. Somebody help me out. HPD? No. Um, DHS? Yes. You have to go with all your children in order to ask yeah. for housing. I find that insanely ridiculous and horrible and harmful for my kid to spend an entire afternoon, evening, late, late night, and the whole next day to be processed? What, am I coming here and saying I have 10 kids when I don't have any kids? Most people who ask for help really need it. They're not making this shit up. It's hard to ask for help. Nobody wants to do it. Um, and I distinctly remember <laughs> being placed that night, 1 a.m. in the morning. I have no idea where we're going. I have no idea what the process is. They're taking us on school buses to somewhere and I'm terrified of what I will see, that one emergency night housing that they place us in. And I arrive at this apartment and I enter and I'm like, okay, there's a kitchen. There's a space that could be a living room. There's closets, there's one bedroom, there's a bathroom, it's clean, which I'm shocked at. And I'm thinking to myself, this is what I need. This is what I'm looking for. Why is this here? And then the next day we are taken away from there and placed into, you must stay at 10 days or something in um, a shelter that is so run down and so terrible and so horrible. And I'm thinking to myself, wait, what about that house? What about that apartment that we were at last night? Why couldn't we stay there? And it's like security, you have to check in, you have to check out when you leave, when you go. We couldn't stay there. For certain reasons, we couldn't stay that minimum 10 days, the required 10 days. And they were like, sorry, yes, so it's all over again. And my kid was like, mom, never take me back there. And he lives with that fear. He lives with that fear. Will we end up there? Will we end up there? And I live with a fear and with a shame. How do I provide housing for my kid when I have a limited income? And also think about this. People that are living on social security or disability, you wanna know how much money they get per month? They don't get $2,000 a month, they don't, but most housing is that amount. How, how do you bridge the gap? I don't understand. And this is for someone, you know, let's say if you're lucky, you don't have kids, right? Rob, you always, you always say that you were one of the lucky ones that could be homeless without children. <sighs> I just, I don't have any words. And of course, you know, how do you create housing for all these different people? It's not easy. And people that are in college, you have the 18 year olds and you have people like me who grew up in a community that did not allow anyone to go to college, who was displaced from a home, but has a kid and her kid has certain needs. You can't just put me in a college room in a dorm. Where would my kid go, right? And scholarships. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I've applied to schools for my bachelor's program by four CUNYs. And then I was selected as a semifinal. And during this, if you will. And I was like, wait, $40,000. Maybe I don't have to stay in CUNY. Maybe I could go to a private school that's quote unquote, more prestigious. I don't know if it really is, you know, at the end of the day, but it gave me that daringness to try. <laughs> I was talking to an education support person that I work with, Blueprint from Blueprint um, Access or Blueprint Education. 
And she was explaining to me, oh, most CUNY schools don't really have big um, scholarships because they're so low in tuition. And I'm like, okay, but there's also, I have to pay for housing and transportation and food. And also not everything is about basics. I want to be able to take my kid to the Union Park. I want to be able to take him on a trip. I want to be able to go away for a weekend. If I have to work all the time and also go to school, where does that leave me with? What's my quality of life like? And that affects our mental health and that affects our ability to give back to our community, to give back to our world. You can't, I mean, I am suffering greatly even while I'm housed, right? With the constant terror of when will this end? How will I find a new place? Oh, you got a, a scholarship, but it only covers tuition. Okay, but what about the rest of it? I know there's no easy answer. I know there's no who's responsible for this. Um, then there are the Ivy Colleges. They were like, come to our school. We'll waive your tuition. We might even give you housing, right? I have a unique situation because my kid only lives with me part of the week. He doesn't live with me full time. So let's say if I could, let's say he can live with me full time, would they also provide housing for me and my son? Some colleges have started to. They're starting to realize, oh, not only 18 year olds go to college, sometimes 35 year olds who have kids. But I have an even more unique situation that my kid is stuck here in Brooklyn. I can't move him anywhere. And no school that I know of anyways, here in New York City has that option. We'll waive your tuition because you're 35 years and older or whatever, or because you need it. Oh, you need housing? Great. What are your housing needs? No one is asking this question. No one. The Ivy Leagues are great, but in order for that to happen, you need to go sometimes maybe out of state. There are many, many gaps and like ways that the system is failing us. And there are no easy answers, but I am afraid that those at the top, first of all, are not affected. So they can't even think of these questions. And second of all, they don't realize that there are so many nuances. And also we don't need more buildings to be constructed. There are buildings, they exist, they're just empty. They're just not formulated correctly. And the housing lottery, really, come on. That feels like a, like a, like a, like a mean thing. I don't know. I'm 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 <laughs> I'm upset. Um, I I do believe that talking about this stuff makes people aware, um, and I do hope that by making people aware, it'll get them thinking. And people that do have access and do have the means will be moved to work towards building something better. Because those that are suffering, while we are trying to raise awareness and while we are trying to make a better life. It is very, very, very difficult for us to do that. Shandy, thank you. I think everybody up on this stage gets it. Um, I appreciate you opening up the way you did. I do believe we have to share our stories, right? And I would say that's what got me the support that I needed. Um, we will have one more one-on-ones. Shandy and I have had several one-on-one -on -one conversations and I'll continue to have those conversations with you. Systems are perfect, we know it. Um, I think Jessica as a city representative gets it and knows it's not perfect and on a mission to change. She opened up about some of that earlier, right? There were problems there. Um, it's a huge problem. I don't have all the answers right now and I don't know how soon we can fix it but I do know that it's gonna take the collaboration from all sectors of society to make that change. And one of the roles, what I keep saying is, we have, to, we have to work together to figure it out. And we have to, society is lacking humanity in, in ways that I've never seen in my lifetime, right? Where we're individuals, we don't care about one another and that has to change, it has to start there, right? And I've had debates with other people and you know, particularly uh, uh, because we're in an academic setting, Tom knows him real well. David Harvey and I had a debate about three years ago about individualism. And I always ask him, how much are we complicit in our own problems? Because we salivate for material things, right? And I'm not, I'm not saying this for you, but I'm just saying in society in general, we think about ourselves rather than humanity as a whole. And that's what we have to change. We have to get people thinking and caring about one another, caring about your neighbors. I, you know, I don't know who my neighbors are in my building, and that's the way it's been for years. How do we, how do we change humanity? It's, it's a big question, 
but at the same time, how do we support folks in a situation like you're in, Shady? And, you know, it's something that I'm willing to take on that fight. And, you know, I think everybody who's sitting up here because they're in this discussion are willing to do the same. It's not easy and uh, we feel your pain. And finally, with respect to the schools, I think we can do a better job. CUNY was free just before I graduated high school. And I was angry. All my cousins went to CUNY schools for nothing. Then all of a sudden, you know, I'm ready to go to college and I got to pay, right? Like all my cousins went for free, what's up, right? And then I think that the other thing is we have to think as a society, right? Uh, we've never addressed poverty and that's the underlying issue that we're all talking about here, right? We've never addressed it in this country, but we found a way to give people a stimulus check. And I think like some of the Nordic countries, we can bring people to a basic living income, right? We have to figure that out. It's not that hard, right? There are countries in the Nordic regions, if your family only brings in 16,000 and they say you need 20,000 to, to have a basic <laughs> a life in this country, then we're going to send you a $4,000 check every year. We sent out $1,200 checks to all of us last year, whatever it was, right? So not everybody needs those checks. Who does need them? Figure it out, right? We have the intelligence to be able to do that. So I think we have to think outside of the box. It's a holistic problem, not necessarily pointing at New York City, but I think it's a bigger problem in this country that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I'll just add, put in another pitch for the administrative burdens question. So you talked about Norway. Um, similarly, we've done a lot of research in my former job around housing policies in the UK, which are not perfect. But when I, they, you know, they have a, they have a housing subsidy that's virtually universal and it's just a standard amount, right? It's a thousand pounds, whatever the number is, that is the housing subsidy. New York, the housing subsidy for a single adult is $215. It hasn't been updated in about 30 years. So it's like a laughably small amount. That's like almost not even worth. Like I'm not even sure why we bother, frankly. Um, and when we go to have any other kind of housing subsidy, um, we spend an outrageous amount of time calculating exactly, exactly how much you need. When I tried to, descri to describe our Section 8 process, where we say, okay, well, we calculate your income, and then we calculate 30% of your income, and then we deduct it if you have a medical expense, da, 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 and then you have to send me your pay stub so I know what your income is, and then send it to me again so I know it hasn't changed. It was like, they looked at me like I was crazy. They were like, well, you couldn't do that. Then you'd have to like get every single person's income information separately, and you have a whole, and I was like, yeah, that's literally what we do. They thought I was nuts. And that is a system that we've created for what is actually in many, in some respects, a pretty well-funded rental subsidy program. Um, but we like, we, we make it hard and we're making it hard on purpose. Um, so, you know, like literally also today, Rob and I had a call. I don't know how you fit in so much today, um, <laughs> but the, uh, with the federal government who dictates a lot of these rules, um, and it's really, you know, it's heartening to know that there's more and more people thinking about these things, right? There was a great article in the Atlantic Monthly called the time tax and sort of getting into the zeitgeist of the culture that maybe this is not the best way to go. Um, I get a benefit. It's called the 401k program, right? I have a certain amount of money. It gets deducted from my paycheck. It goes into a rental. It goes into a retirement fund for me. Um, but nobody ever asked me if I deserve it. Nobody ever asked me if I need it. No one ever asked me what I spend the money on. Um, and they presume that I am eligible for it, which I am. And then, you know, is there a world where I could defraud the IRS, put too much money, do some other thing? Maybe, maybe they'll come after me and catch me. Maybe they won't. And we, but we create a system that says like, yeah, Jessica can probably get that money. Do it through your, it's done through my employer. I never have to fill out a form. It just kind of, it comes off of my paycheck every month. And then when I'm ready to retire, there'll be a little bit of money there waiting for me. Um, contrast that with how we administer a Section 8 program, where it's first get on the wait list, then fill out the application, then tell us how poor you are, then tell us how poor you are again, then let's make sure you're still poor, let's make sure you're poor again. Um, and then we really torture people and it's, it, it's, it's the administrative burdens that we create in for the programs that we say we're trying to help people the most are incredibly um, painful and something that we really need to tackle head on. And again, like I had a, I had a lovely job at a think tank that I, where I was doing research and writing white papers about all the amazing housing policies that we should do. Um, and I really, really enjoyed myself and probably should have stayed there. So it was, it's really, it's, it's a really a blessing to be able to take this on and be able to actually do the hard work of getting this stuff done. And I'm really grateful to have that opportunity. Um, I do want to make a pitch for housing supply though, as controversial as it may be. 
So I wish I'd brought you some charts, but there are two, two ways that I look at this. One is that over the last 10 years, um, New York City has created about three to four times as many jobs as we've created housing units. So that's like one important stark metric to me about how, while we've seen this amazing amount of economic growth, the way in which that has suddenly somehow not accrued to be a benefit to everybody. So it should be, so we've, we have this huge distance suddenly in the last 10 years that were particularly, it's the, the two lines were never even, um, but we've created a massive amount of new jobs, which should have created a massive amount of new economic activity. And they're not all wildly high paying jobs. There's middle class jobs and, and at all levels, um, but we're not creating the same amount of housing. So that's creating a crunch all across the region. Um, and we also, when you look at the amount of housing that we've created per capita, um, if you look at the top of the list of cities across the country, at the top, you see Seattle, Denver, Austin, the kind of cities that you think about where you think of a reasonable standard of living, a high standard of living and a reasonable cost of living where you hear people kind of flocking to. Um, and New York City is down at the bottom of the list in terms of housing production, again, adjusted for population. We're down with Indianapolis, Detroit, Philadelphia, places where you think of housing vacancy as being their primary problem and housing quality being their primary problem. So those are, you know, just some of the ways that we look at housing supply in New York and why we have a situation where we struggle, frankly, to enforce source of income discrimination, which you're currently experiencing, it sounds like, where we have a series of landlords who are saying they don't accept Section 8 vouchers, but most of them are not bold enough to come out and say, I don't, I don't allow a Section 8, I don't accept a Section 8 voucher. What most of them say is, sorry, the apartment's taken. And they're telling the truth. The apartment is taken because there's so many people who are competing for that one apartment. They just say, I want I want you. I want the one that doesn't have a voucher for whatever various reasons. Um, and so that makes it very difficult to enforce source of income discrimination because there is somebody else who wants that apartment and they moved in and you have these open houses. And plus, you know, as soon as Shiny does find an apartment that she has, now all of a sudden she has to fill out 50 forms that send them over to the housing authority. They send them back. And the landlord's like, I... What are, what are we doing here? I have 50 other people who want this apartment. Um, so the really the mismatch of housing supply and then overlay administrative burdens is really is a really tricky one and one that we really need to attack head on. There's one what? other part, sorry, that you know if you are lucky to have help in any way from the state or government, that just keep you there. You're not allowed to have more than $2,000 in your bank account. You're not allowed to have more than $2,000 in your savings account. And I'm like, so you want me to stay poor? Even if I have a hope of, you know, one day not needing your services, you want me to stay here. So I want you all to think about that. You're not even letting me try to get out of here. That I think is like another level of frustration. You know, people have many ways of earning income, earning money, and then you can't even have it. You have to hide it or like what? Give it away? Like, what am I supposed to do? Because eventually you do want to have your own space. You don't want to be a slave to a, a landlord or something. You want to have your own space. You want to be as secure as possible. But, oh, wait, you don't have $50,000 to put down because you can't have the savings? Like, how, how does this even work? Sorry. My rent is never going to end. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I wanted to, I just wanted to, um, agree with you that supply has uh, a lot to do with it, but the problem is not that there's a lack of supply. The supply is all in the wrong places. So the building boom occurs at the high end and you have a 30, 40% occupancy uh, um, vacancies uh, in the million dollar apartments on Millionaire's Row, you, ha you have these buildings and they're built with public subsidies, 421A. Uh, public money goes into subsidizing that development and not subsidizing market rate housing for those at the bottom of the income bracket. So it's, it's not just supply. And instead of incentivizing luxury developers to add 10 or 15 or 20 percent so-called affordable housing, which if you look at the income brackets who qualify, isn't really affordable to the people who need it the most. Instead of doing that, let's put those subsidies where they're needed the most. First of all, everybody who is unhoused 
take care of all the unhoused. You could do that with a fraction of the subsidies that are going into uh, 421A. Then you can work your way up the need, uh, uh, the needs and put public money into, the, into all of those programs. And that will include, hey, what happened to Mitchell Lama housing? Middle income housing, co-ops for middle income working people. And you know, they're disappearing one by one, little by little. Let's put some more public money into middle income housing and low and uh, how and NYCHA housing. Um, there's a $40 billion deficit uh, uh, to fix NYCHA so that it's habitable. Uh, plus, there are all kinds of needs that are unmet by NYCHA because they don't have the budget. So it's, it's really, you know, the, pro the problem also that everybody is facing is we still have this notion of the deserving poor. So we're going to put our subsidy money in, but you individually have to prove that you're poor enough to merit this little piddling subsidy that we're going to give you. And that has gotten worse um, in the last 30 or 40 years uh, as the New Deal has been uh, put in the, in the garbage bin of history little by little um, because government can't do anything. That's the myth. It all has to be done by incentivizing the private market. And as a result, you get a lot of people in government and a lot of government agencies who are mentally um, wrapped around this idea and who believe their, mis their mission is to make sure that public money is spent judiciously, not to help your community, not to help you individually, but uh, to make sure the budget office doesn't come after you for uh, misappropriating public funds. So those are the it's psychological, it's social. And the final thing I would just say is individually, we're not gonna solve any of these problems. So there are three principles that communities have to follow and individuals have to follow. Organize, organize, and organize. Because unless people organize to make change, it's not gonna happen on an individual level. Uh, and it's not gonna happen between you and the individual sitting in, in a government office or your elected official who has many other constraints uh, is one among many. So um, organize, that's the solution. I think there's also, I mean, this is radically not pragmatic, but private property as a commodity is working perfectly. <laughs> and every time a government official or a judge uh, interferes with uh, this idea of organizing or mobilizing, they're going back and supporting the perfect system of private property. So I think it's also just acknowledging that there is a problem and this problem is private property. And that unless we're going to address that issue, then we're gonna keep running into this same mythology. I think. The two things are related, the private property system of the deserving poor, and then this myth of not being able to forgive student loans because of course money's real, although not in 2008, right? Uh, and we've got a political class that says that uh, people should repay their debts. Of course, it's the same political class that doesn't repay their own debts uh, and does exactly the kind of thing, Shiny, that you brought out. Yes, you're supposed to hide your money. That's exactly what you're supposed to do if you want to move up economically uh, the legal way. And so I think it's just about being bold and courageous while we're organizing and saying this is a reality, that this private property problem is not going away. And simply, you know, thinking about it in terms of uh, developing our way out of it, I think, is just not taking the big picture uh, and, and putting it into view, in my opinion. 
So Jason, I want to follow that up with a response. I, I in many aspects agree with you, but uh, Tom just said, organize, organize, organize. As an organizer, when I go into the community to start to talk about our economic system, I'm met with like, that's too heady for me, Rob, get out of here with that shit, right? But that's the reality. You got to talk about that stuff. Um, it's a lot of what I do. It's a lot of what I studied with Tom and others. And I mentioned Richard Wolf, you know, uh, David Harvey, I threw his name in. These are Marxist theorists, right? These are folks that have influenced my way of thinking. But when you bring that to the community and you try to have the conversation, you're met with resistance. I will say this, and I'll give props to the Occupy movement. Right. They brought economic injustice to the forefront and they gave us common language to talk about it. The one percent and the ninety nine percent. You go to any park and you see a five year old can identify himself as the ninety nine percent and point somewhere else as the one percent. It was something easy for us to digest. So it has to start somewhere. But I think the conversations revolve around our economic system and understanding how that economic system affects our lives. But it's too heady for some people when they're dealing with everyday life, right? You're a professor. You get it. You've studied this stuff. You know, I've been in academic spaces. We've all studied it. But, you know, if I go in my African-American community and talk about that, they're like, yo, Rob, have a nice day. Get out of here with that shit, right? I, I, I don't disagree that there's a certain middle class resistance to those ideas. But in my own experience of organizing, I don't find that to be in every community. And I think there are lots and lots and lots of communities uh, again, going back to but who's being marginalized right now in the conversation about forgiving student debt? Who's being marginalized right now in the conversation about housing, right? And I, I, I like the idea, it sounds nice. It's a lovely idea when people say in, in democratic government that the people who are harmed or affected by the issue need to be in charge of the policy. I just don't see it as being realistic for a, a similar reason to what you're saying is that I don't think that the topics are too heady. I think that the language perhaps, and I don't know that we need to say it's Marxist or anything else, it could just be common sense. Uh, I, I just think that the way that we phrase the concepts are not the way that they're phrasing the concepts in their own communities. And so I think if we really want to be organizing in a way that's putting pressure on elites, uh, for lack of a better word, I think we need to be speaking a different language up to elites and not the other way. And I think we have to resist when government officials uh, and others, other elites are saying the people most affected need to be the ones coming up to policy solutions. I think that's crazy. I think the people who are in positions of government need to be coming up to the policy solutions. They can certainly listen to people and they can go into communities like you're advocating, but they're going to have to learn a new way of speaking. They're going to have to learn a different process. They're going to have to unlearn many of the things that they learned to get those jobs that got them there. And I, you know, these are not lessons that I learned in law school or that I learned right, from reading right. a book. These are lessons long before I went to college, you know, and I think but, that's the dilemma. I think. But maybe the debate is who is getting those jobs as elected officials, right? Yeah. So, you know, um, we vote them in. Are we doing our homework to understand how that person thinks? So I, again, I asked the question, how complicit are we in our own problems, right? Like we don't take, I'll tell you right now, you know, the lady sitting next to me is in, and I said this on a, a larger call today, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of being involved in electoral politics, but I do believe we have to make political links. But I do also think we need to get the right kind of people in those positions to make the decisions or help us make those decisions. So that's part of the challenge that we're facing, right? Um, I, you know, I, I don't think we're, we're talking different. I think we realize what the problems is, but how to solve them, you know, we might be coming from different directions. And, but I, I, I still think it, it, it's conversations that have to happen in communities and that aren't happening enough, right? Um, so how do we create the space? Tom says, organize, organize, organize. But I always challenge the organizers to say, when are we gonna create the space to say, is the conversations we're having making sense? Is the work we're doing, the strategies and tactics we're using making any change? then maybe we need to take a step back and change if it isn't making change. So, you know, it's, it, it's tough. Organizing is not easy. It's a, it's a challenge and getting people to 
you know, people always ask me, how did, Rob, you went through homelessness. How did you deal with all of this stuff and, you know, start to think, well, I didn't have anything else to do, to be honest with you folks, except go to the library. So I might as well open a book and read. And gentrification was rearing its ugly head while I was on the streets of Miami. Okay, I keep hearing this word. What does it mean? And I just learned as much as I could. And when I came back to New York City in the shelter, I did the same thing. I'd go to, I was in a shelter behind Port Authority bus terminal. I don't want to name the place, but I would go to the 40th Street Library every day, study gentrification. Wanted to understand what was happening in communities. It's, you know, it's a word that we throw out there, but there's a lot of things that encompass that word, displacement, uh, force out, you know, development, all of those things you had to learn in the process. And, you know, probably uh, as a member of Picture of the Homeless, I used to bug Tom to say, okay, I keep hearing this word gentrification, but people, being forced out through Hope Six and some of these federal programs, where do they go? So, Tom, help me out here. I want to learn about this place and I need to understand this issue, right? But it's for the average person, these are topics that you know people like. I got enough on my plate, like you know, I'm trying to feed my family. I'm trying to find stable housing, right? I can't deal with this. I don't know the perfect answer. I do know we need to keep working at it, and with respect to solutions. I, don't, I said in the beginning, I don't think we were going to find solutions to all of these problems today, but I think it's about having, creating the spaces to have the conversations, right? And, you know, I've, I'm committed here and I hope I can work with Shindy to work with some of the other faculty and administration here to try to figure out some solutions going forward. We obviously have a bridge to government and elected officials and whatever we come up with, that's a, a broader conversation, right? To bring other people into the fold. So it's a process that we're gonna have to put together to, to make this change. Yeah, so as the uh, resident government official um, <laughs> and most of my career has been in government, although I was fortunate to spend the last four years in the advocacy world. So I, I feel like I'm at, a, I'm at a moment in my work life where I'm feeling very unusually uh, aware of the kind of chessboard of everybody working together, um, having just sort of switched hats very recently. Um, and one of the reasons why Rob and I work together so well is that we've worked together through a variety of different roles that each of us have had. And so we kind of know who the other person is on the chessboard and what our role is in that moment and the kind of, you know, sometime distinction between our personal and our professional perspectives, but also just what tools do we have at our disposal and what our, what our mandate is in that moment. Um, so an example of that that I want to bring up in terms of the role of government and the um, role of advocacy and the um, strategies around fixing some of these problems and also having the space to talk about how we can make even bigger picture fixes is around public housing. So in, um, you know, public housing in New York City faces an outrageously insane capital need. Um, it is around 40 or by some estimates, $50 billion. Um, we, are, we are approximately half, we're almost half of the capital need for the entire country in public housing. So even if you had the most perfectly aligned federal government, where just would not be structurally set up for the Congress of the United States. We could have a hundred senators who all they wanted was to help public housing and we still would not get 50% of the money going to New York City specifically. Um, I personally and professionally believe that the housing authority needs all the resources and all the partners that they can get. Um, but there is this very robust and reasonable and smart debate about what constitutes privatization of public housing and what kind of resource, what, what strings attached would those resources come with. So my problem is that I'm not in charge of capitalism. That's not in my portfolio uh, at this time, <laughs> maybe someday. Um, and we could be talking, we could be debating commodification and privatization and capitalism until those buildings collapse into the fucking That's right. ground. That's right. and, and that is just something that we really, really have to face. Um, and so we have a couple of tools at our disposal right now. Some of them are great. Some of them are just okay. Some of them are not nearly what we would expect. Um, and it's just it's just a thing that we have to just fix. Um, and the and in that particular case, the time is kind of over for debating. Like we're really in a crisis moment right now. Um, so as the bridge from my advocacy hat to my um, government hat, one of the things that we looked at was around models of um, public housing regeneration that had the tenants making the decision about what will be the future of their building. 
Right now, the tenants have no autonomy over what happens in their buildings. Um, and there's and they have every reason to mistrust the housing authority and the government in a larger way about what's going on because there have been so many broken promises and so much disinvestment. Um, and so one thing that we had asked for in my former hat and what the many tenants had asked for is if we are going to bring in these new third parties that are not just the government, that are not just the housing authority to help with this public housing problem, can't we just, can you just let us be part of that process in some way, shape or form? And for many years, the tenants were told, no, we're not allowed to do it. We're not allowed to do it because it's a procurement issue. There's a legal issue. There's a confidentiality issue. There's all these different reasons why it's not possible for a public housing tenant to be sitting at the table when a decision is made about who the development partners are and who the financial partners are in the regeneration of one of their projects. Um, so I was lucky enough to be in the room in, with my advocacy hat when that happened, when you'd heard city hall officials say, no, I'm really sorry. We checked with the lawyers and the lawyer said it's not possible because it's a procurement issue. And I said, hang on, what procurement issue? Like, show me, show me the piece of paper where the, show me what the procurement law is that tells us that we can't do that. Um, and it was nonsense. There's no procurement issue with doing that. So what we were able to accomplish last year, prior to me coming back into city government, was for four developments in Chelsea, the tenants wrote the RFP for their private development partners. They wrote the scoring sheet by which those decisions would be made. Um, we had private developers from all over the city decide, like, apply to that thing that had been crafted to the tenants to that request for proposals. And then the tenants sat around with three big binders and one from each proposal and took a look and did a really deep dive into all the aspects of a development project and to figure out which was the development partner that they felt like would best meet their needs, which one they could count on when the chips were down, which one they felt the most comfortable had being an honest broker and being able to negotiate with when things change, which they 100% inevitably will, there's no question. Um, and so that was kind of the, you know, that was the grand compromise that we made where that we were going to bring in this private money and these private partners, but the tenants were the ones who were in the driver's seat selecting it. And so far it's really gone miraculously well. And it was sort of a wonderful marriage of this this, you know, what felt to many as, as like an academic ideal of having a very capital, like lowercase d democracy happening in a public housing tenant and the very practical needs and the sense of urgency that the tenants felt because the tenants did not want to sit around and have an academic discussion about the best social structure for their housing. They wanted their toilet fixed. So it was a kind of an interesting marriage of all those different voices coming together um, and something that we're really proud of and we'd like to do more of. So that's just my, that's my pitch for kind of the chessboard that we have on this table here today of having everyone sort of play their roles and find a way to work together and then actually move the ball forward in a really practical way. There are of course ways of having academic conversations about fixing a toilet among people. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I do think though, I mean, just in response, I mean, I think, yes, of course. I mean, none of us are in charge of capitalism, but I, I do believe you are somewhat in charge of getting housing out of capitalism, right? And I think, I'm just wondering what would be your response then to a situation like Berlin, where let's say advocates and mobilizers were successful and they're saying, we want these large corporations out of New York City. I mean, that would put you in a bind if you were saying, you know, I'm not in charge of capitalism, right? I mean, you kind of get where I'm going, I think, right? I mean, I don't try to push you off the chessboard. For I think of sure, sure. <laughs> flip over the chessboard. Flip it over. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm in charge of getting capitalism out of housing. I think I'm in charge of getting New Yorkers housed. But isn't it like diametrically opposed? Like, isn't like capitalism? You're saying you don't see it that way. Right? I don't. Yeah. I don't. But if it were, because <laughs> when I think I'm right, I would just even make sure I'm being heard correctly. I think it's like it's not getting capitalism out of housing, right? Again, I think that would be beyond your 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 purview. But it's getting housing out of capitalism. I mean, if your focus is on public housing, then there really shouldn't be any connection to capitalism. Then. I I mean, I think that public housing is a perfect example of how of the failures of that concept. And I think we yet and yet we have a very successful models of public private partnerships that are not crumbling into the ground right now. But do you if if it depends on uh, overthrowing capitalism, uh, 
to solve a single housing problem like the New York City Housing Authority, which is a minute portion of the total housing stock in New York City. Why should it have to depend on changing the whole system? There are many different ways that public, the public can support public housing um, it, it, short of handing it over to private developers. Uh, I think involving the tenants in self-governance is a very important part of it because one of the problems with public housing has always been, it's been run like a plantation. Um, you know, very often the administration is, uh, knows everything and they allocate the funds where they think they're best uh, allocated. They have tenant association, resident associations, which are basically adjuncts of the administration. That hasn't worked. So I, I look forward to new models. I, I hope Chelsea turns out, but I'm not, I'm not banking on it. But I, I think that the, the, the last thing I would just say is the things that I taught when I was at CUNY and other schools that I always taught, if you're gonna go into government, keep your head on straight. And um, if you have uh, real reform ideas, don't drop them. But you know what? 80% of my former students, uh, I, I criticize some of them. When I see you went into government, what did you do? You just sat. You used to talk about social change and you're not doing anything. Oh, well, you know, the system, the system you're in the system. You got to do something to change it. It got me in trouble when I was in the system, when I worked for government. I didn't keep my mouth shut. I had the good fortune of having um, a degree in higher education, but that doesn't necessarily protect you. Actually, that makes you even more suspicious uh, if you know something. And, uh, but when we, we need to change government from the bottom to the top so that it is actually serving people and on the individual level, as well as on the macro level, when you, when you find a, a huge system like public housing, it was eaten out. It was deconstructed by the administrations that ran public housing. Yes, it was money, but it was more than just money. It wasn't just the lack of capital, uh, uh, capital spending. It, it, was the, it was the people in public housing too that accepted the status quo and didn't really fight it tooth and nail right from the beginning. And, uh, and some, of the, some of the major advocates of public housing who were in the housing authority, retired, left, got fed up, had their budgets cut and gave up, that's it. So it's both structural, but it's also individual. And my, my, my message to the students, to the budding professionals is, Yes, you have to, you have to believe in that deep change and, and, keep, and keep it up. And you may not win awards, but you'll, you'll go home and sleep at night. You'll sleep well at night. I think Tom and I could probably debate vigorously <laughs> pretty much every housing policy under the sun, but don't be afraid to make trouble in government is one that I think we can hold hands on for sure. Go. Good. I, I just want to make a, I know we're running short on time, so I want to make a couple of quick comments in closing. I do think there are models. It's not necessarily public housing, but the National Alliance of HUD Tenants have organized, and HUD is Housing and Urban Development, the federal government agency, where they've taken subsidized housing and taken control of it, but forced their way after organizing to have a participatory process to make that happen. And they govern the houses where they live. And in many instances, they've taken it over. Great models down in Miami. Um, I usually attend 
um, the HUD conference in DC every June. And, and it's fascinating to hear how many buildings they've acquired through a process similar to what was, what was just presented here for public housing and those participatory processes. I also want to say with respect to Berlin, and I'm going to go back to human rights, right? It's my, it's the space I'm most comfortable in. So Leilani Farhar and Ada Kalau, who was the mayor of Barcelona at the time, were in New York for the UN High Political Forum in July 2018. And across the street at the, my, I think it's the UN Millennium Hotel, there's a fancy hotel across the street. They had a, a meeting with big city mayors from all over the world come in and they're deciding how we're going to remove private uh, public property from private access. And the mayor of Berlin was the first one to stand up and say, as long as I'm mayor, no more public property will be exposed to the private market. It was a huge undertaking. And they went around the table. Many of the governors, they or many of the mayors couldn't make that declaration. At the very least, they'd say, we take it back home. When it came to New York, Alicia Glenn's chief of staff was in place at the time and says, I'll just have to have a discussion with our mayor. I can't answer anything here. And I was taking pictures and I just, you know, it showed me that there's a challenge inside of City Hall for the type of people that Tom was just talking about that are willing to go in there and take risk and make chances, uh, take a chance to make real change, right? You saw a big city mayor like Berlin stand up and make that declaration. The other said, we'll take it back. But Alicia Glenn says, I'll just have to have a discussion. Uh, her representative said, I have a discussion and we'll get back to you. And they never got back to them, right? So, you know, it, it's a lot of change that has to happen. Um, I'm... Again, I'm going to promote the person sitting next to me as a proponent of change, um, big task ahead of her, right? I know some of the roadblocks that she's facing. I hope she gets the autonomy to make the changes that are her vision. Um, she uses her term and I'm going to share. Well, maybe I shouldn't because I don't know where this video is going to go. But anyway, I just, I, I have a lot of hope. I'm hopeful right now. And folks who know me well know I don't like to work so close to government representatives, but I'll stand side by side with this person because there's a lot of trust. Uh, there's a lot of trust and we've worked together in the past. So hopefully it'll make for a better future for people like Shandy and many others in the city. But I'm also committed directly to Kingsborough and the staff and myself and Shandy and others will have conversations about that going forward. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah, I, you know, we'll, we'll thank everybody for the comments. I think, you know, this is a, a group of people that are all passionate about the issue, want to see change. Um, you know, in our work in the continuum of care, you would hear many people say in those, in that, in those meetings that New York has a complicated housing system. It's true, but I think New York also has smart people that can figure out answers. But you know, we have to find the political will to make the change that is necessary, right? And that starts with getting the right people in office. I'm still a, you know, I will still preach that. We, we, have, to, we have to vote in the right elected officials to make the change that we need to see. One more point that I would add is you have to figure out how to involve people who are not affected by the situation, how to I, I agree. have a conversation with them and be like, how can, how can housing all human people benefit me as an individual. Shandy, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a big fan of collaboration and everybody understand that everybody has a need, right? So I always argue in the social justice world with, with housing groups that we need to bring the homeless together with the tenants, with single family homeowners, right? We all need to have a conversation. Everybody's housing may not look the same, but we all deserve a decent, affordable, dignified place to live. How do we figure that out? We have to have compassion for one another. We have to exercise humanity and that's where it starts. We've gotten away from that. I'll, I'll keep going back to that. We don't, we lack caring about one another and that's a big part of this issue, folks. Well, you know, having seen other local governments from the inside, New York City is notorious for having a highly centralized um, political structure. It's very large in comparison to most other cities in the country. Uh, and line agencies 
are like little fiefdoms in and of themselves. It's very interesting that Michael Bloomberg spent three uh, uh, terms trying to break up this kind of dysfunctional system and add new brains and add new money, uh, reorganize things, uh, but it didn't happen. And um, it's, it's still there, you know, so it, it, we're looking at transportation. You can't get the transportation department uh, to put in a, we had a bicycle master plan, 1994, which I'm saying I was proud to be part of preparing that plan. Not, not even 15% of it has been implemented. Uh, Bloomberg said he was gonna implement it. He didn't do it. Now, what is going on here? There are smart people there. There are good managers there. He hires the best talent and it doesn't get done. And I point my finger again to some, uh, some of the young folks in the agencies who aren't yelling and screaming and organizing and doing things, um, putting uh, uh, facts on the ground, for example, so that the politicians will see what works. Instead of hearing from the agencies, oh, you can't do that because DOT won't, uh, uh, regulations won't permit it. Well, there's a reason you can't do anything. And Corporation Council, the mayor's lawyers will have 10 reasons why you can't do it, uh, why, why agencies can't do anything. So there's a systemic problem. So we need to get good people in political office, good elected officials. We need to get good people in the agencies. I, I, I think one of the upticks for me was the Dinkins administration. And the current mayor actually looks back at the Dinkins administration, as well as Bloomberg as inspiration. Well, what can we learn from the Dick Dinkins administration? They brought in people from communities into government. And I wag my finger again at some of those folks because government ate them instead of them um, uh, taking control of government and reforming it uh, because it's such a monster. It requires, uh, each, each of the agencies has its own um, history and uh, principles and portions of federal funding that bind them, state funding, uh, and then state constitution is another problem. But, uh, so I think it, it, requ it requires work at multiple levels and, uh, and organizing again, but organizing not just communities, not just tenants, not just homeowners, but organizing to make those kinds of deep changes that have to be made and keep talking about it as you're organizing to get that little piece of the pie. Anyway. Any questions or comments from this group before we Close out. I know we're at time. The folks in the room, anybody, anything to say? Thank you for being here. Thank you to everybody that's online. And Dory, do you want to? Thank you so much. Thank you.